everyone. And without any further ado, the following talk is called Using Python with Network Analysis to Understand Corruptions in Government Procurement by Bash. And let's please welcome Bash. Hey guys, hello. Um, my name is Albert Yumal, but you can call me Bash. For the next 30 minutes, I will be talking about a project where I use Python and network theory to understand corruption in the Philippine government transactions. But quick introduction about me. I am a data activist based in the Philippines where I use my skill set for social good and social impact. So what I do is I advocate for technology for the people, of the people, and by the people. So recall that even in science and technology, there is a thing that we call myth of objectivity. Even the models that we create in the machine learning models and AI applications that we build, they have biases. And it is ultimately up to us where to put our biases. And for me, as an activist, I want to use it to help serve the marginalized and the oppressed in my country. Originally, my background is instrumentation physics. That is why I am familiar with complex systems and graph theory, which are precursor um, for understanding the concepts in network theory. Now, I transitioned as a full stack data scientist where I work with machine learning models and apply it to solve real world problems. So if you want to connect with me and even collaborate, just please reach me through LinkedIn at Albert Humal, through my blog, alberthumal.github.com, where I put my content about the projects. And of course, on GitHub, where I also put my open source code for the projects that I built. So the code for this session, if you are interested, is also on my GitHub. So feel free to fork and apply it to your own use cases if you also wanted to look at your government procurement data. As a data activist in the Philippines, um, I do a lot of advocacy work. Like in many other countries, we face a lot of problems in the Philippines. For example, we might be one of the most biodiverse habitats in the world, but we are also one of the more challenged economies. As much as data science is most applied by big corporations for profit, it has also immense potential for solving very socially relevant problems. Uh, one project that I did together with a community of AI enthusiasts in the Philippines is to understand the energy landscape of the country. So a few months ago, we were experiencing a lot of power outages as we are heavily reliant on fossil fuel. Coupled it with the context of what's happening in pandemic, we wanted to understand our options so we can rally to the people in the government to take action. So we created this model to predict the best sites in the country where to put solar panels using satellite data and spatial temporal analysis. So ultimately, we were able to characterize the energy crisis and engage more conversations and call to actions. So another project um, that I did together with my colleagues is on aiding virtual plastics in the Philippines. So again, in the context of a pandemic, most of our provinces are low penetration areas, meaning internet bandwidth is very bad. Most of the teachers in those provinces are also not well trained in handling online classes. So what we did is to create a chatbot that helps elementary and high school students with their math classes. So by using the things that we learned in natural language processing techniques, robust API design, we were able to accomplish a prototype that can be scaled for many schools. And a part of the things that I do is also integrating human-centered design. So the chatbot, that we created is onboarded through a progressive web application technology. So you don't need to have Wi-Fi to access the chatbot. You just need mobile signal, which is very relevant to the people who don't have enough access to the internet. Now, data is a very powerful tool as well to fight against unfounded arguments by the state. So during the onset of the rapid COVID increase last year in the country, the spokesperson of the president made the public statement blaming the Filipinos because they say that we are not following the protocols, but the data tells us otherwise. We looked at Google mobility data and counter argued that Filipinos are mostly staying in their houses during the stage of pandemic. Maybe the spike was not mainly due to citizen neglect, but due to lack of foresight, planning, and execution from the side of the state. As you can derive from the example uh, projects that I described, 
there is so much potential for data science, for social good. But the more important thing is if you are solving the relevant, timely, and impactful problems. So recently, all of the mainstream media in the country are reporting about the blatant and rampant corruption in the country, from the mismanagement of pandemic funds to ghost hospitals receiving money. So in a situation where majority of our people are getting hungry and losing options, we really can't afford to have our meager resources squandered by corrupt government officials. And that is the innovation and the motivation of the, this project. How can we show through data the anomalous transactions of government agencies so that we may be able to slag auditing bodies and hold into account those who are stealing from the public treasury? So to give you an insight of the methodology that I use to solve this problem, uh, let us define first what procurement is. So the procurement process includes acquisition of goods, infrastructure, contracts by branch, department, offices, and other agencies, and even consulting services. Basically, it's a government office trying to buy a product, trying to buy a service from a private entity. The agency will then make public what products they need. Companies then will bid and the best value in price quality and compliance will be awarded the sale. So if an agency, agency example um, needs a laptop, they need to have a list of bidders and vote for the best offer. In an ideal world, this should be very straightforward, but in reality, it is more complex. There are instances where officials who own also businesses would wave their invisible hands and direct the sales for their profit. And we wanted to avoid that. So people uh, taking opportunity of the public funds, even though they are already in office. As for the data set uh, that I used, luckily, there are already efforts in the Philippines to encourage open data. And that's what I love about Taiwan. To have a very robust open data advocacies and initiatives. So recently, there was a law on freedom of information that mandates government data to be public. One of the departments that handle procurement data in the country is called PhilJEPS, as you can see on the screen, uh, or the Philippine Government Electronic Procurement System. It is a single centralized electronic portal that serves as the primary and definitive source of information on government procurement. So the good thing is that they um, capture all of the data uh, transacted by the government. So currently it contains data from 2000 to the second quarter of 2021. So that's around 20 years of data and that's amazing. But the problem is it's not also the cleanest. So you try to download the data from the field jobs in the open data. Mostly they are flat files. So meaning the files are in CSV files, but the column format and the names varies. So some data wrangling are required, which is almost always the case for real world data. Another problem is that there are no data dictionaries and metadata. So I had to do my assignment and consult procurement experts regarding the relevance of the fields and columns that I am trying to handle. So the main goal of this project is to really create a network that describes the relationships of the agencies and the bidders that they are trying to buy products from. Of course, it is no brainer that we have to import our math heads and also the heads of the domain experts to solve this problem. Then we have to deal with null values and duplicates and also filter the relevant fields for our network. For demonstration, we will only use agency name, be their name, product name, and transaction price. Only then can we talk about constructing the network. But what is a network anyway? So mathematically, a network is just a mathematical representation of a data point and how it is connected to other data points. These data points are the circles that you can see on the slides we call nodes or vertices, and the lines connecting them we call edges or links. Thus, mathematically, we define the system as a function of the nodes and edges that we define. There are a plethora of applications of network analysis in the real world because most of our natural systems, as we've learned from physics, are complex systems, meaning no data point is truly isolated. 
Common applications of network analysis include computer networks and the internet, protein synthesis, and even solving uh, or even finding the vaccine for, for the COVID-19. They also tried to use and even used um, network analysis to find the best synthesis of proteins for the vaccine. Uh, we also use it for tracking terrorism and drug cartels. But in general, all of these systems, all of these examples that I cited can be abstracted by just connections of nodes and edges. For those of you who are also singles and looking for a love interest, you can also use separate analysis to narrow down your options and optimize your chance in finding your true love. But enough of the segue. Again, there's so many applications of network theory. The imagination um, is the limit. Now, there are two types of network, the undirected and the directed network. If direction of the relationship is important, it is directed. Otherwise, it is undirected. Direction is simply the flow of information. And depending on the way that you define your network, the mathematics will also have to change. Uh, for this demonstration, we just wanted to simplify everything. So to simplify it, the procurement network that I will construct, I will make it as an undirected network. So the good thing about network analysis is that the mathematics is very concise and very visual. So basic statistics that you've learned in, in college is still applied. You just have to make it more elegant and suitable for describing networks. So similar to just replacing variables for calculating average just in a network context. One metric called the degree, for example, uh, tries to answer the question, who has the most number of connections in the network? This can correlate to who is the most important or influential node in your system. So in the context of procurement, this is the most active agency and probably who has the most money or budget allocation facilitating the bidding. So for 2020, for example, the Department of Health has the highest degree because of the pandemic. Very understandable and very obvious. And the data tells it too. Now, networks can also have weights, which is characterized by the thickness of the edges. This is one way for us to add dimension and complexity to our network. In the context of procurement, we can use price as our weight. So the thicker the line is, the more expensive the product or the service is. A huge portion of network theory also uses matrices, so it is important that you brush up your linear algebra when you want to deal with your network analysis. Now, another metric that we might want to look at is called the betweenness centrality. It answers the question, who connects the most other nodes in the network? So these nodes are very highly influential as they transcend beyond nodes near to them. So in a procurement network, agencies with high betweenness centrality might be a good point of interest because they usually are the middleman between certain transactions. And that's a point of interest that we might want to investigate. And one final metric that I will share with you that I also usually use is called the community detection. It answers the question, who forms distinct communities within the network? One application for this is on quantifying communities of fake news propagators, which is very rampant in my country. On the other hand, in procurement, communities might be agencies and leaders that are in cahoot with each other. So usually we use scholar as a dimension to visually separate the communities apart. The main library that we use in Python for network analysis is NetworkX. It is a package that allows for the creation, manipulation, and study of the structure, dynamics, and functions of complex networks. It contains most of the standard algorithms and has very strong community of developers that support it. So all of the metrics that I mentioned a while ago, they are all available in Network X. You can also use it to explore graph configurations and more advanced network statistics and metrics. One way to know this, of course, is by reading the documentation. And again, there's a plethora of information already available in the open web. So feel free to do your own research on it. As a reference for network science, I would recommend this book by Albert Parabasi. He's one of the forefront scientists in the network sciences. The book is free and it's very comprehensive. So feel free to download. It's downloadable for free. 
Just search Network Science by Albert Parabasi. Now that we have uh, an idea of what network analysis is, what are the tools um, available for us in Python to implement it? We can now use basic data analysis to understand uh, the different problems that we define. But our context is corruption. So the question is, what does corruption look like in data or even in a network graph? So let's look at this example. The big circle here represents a hospital in the Philippines. The small circles are the companies that bid for a particular product or service that the agency or the hospital is trying to buy. The lines connecting them or the edges are the prices of that specific bid or transaction. As you can see, the big blue circle has the highest number of nodes connected, meaning it has the highest degree. One example of a corrupt practice is bid rigging. So bid rigging happens when groups of firms conspire to raise prices or lower the quality of goods, works, or services offered in public tenders. Now, bid rigging always aims to eliminating competition, resulting in very high prices. Thus, the government pays more or loses in quality. Now, mapping and understanding the operation of the market can help us avoid collusion arrangements or bid rigging conspiracies between competitors and network analysis is one way to view those type of um, indicators in bid tricking. Another indicator of corruption is low competition. If you get the median number of bidders per product or even compare it to other countries, or there is a single company that is the sole bidder, that might be a point of concern and a good area for investigation. More connections and average line thickness across the connections are generally an indicator of a healthy procurement because there is more competition and the prices are more or less uniformly distributed. And that's what we want for a healthy procurement metric. Now, another metric that you can use is looking at the distribution of the bid prices. If there, is a, there are prices that are way off from the expected distribution, that also might be a point of concern. We can also use community detection algorithms to identify agencies which have similar procurement patterns that might be red flags as well. This might tell us which agencies and bidders are in kaput with each other. So community detection is one tool that we can identify patterns between similarities in the communities that we've identified. I used to get another Python library to render the network generated by Network X. Bokeh is a cool Python tool for dynamic visualization. I also used Heroku for deployment of the web application that I created using Streamlit. And Streamlit is a very, very popular Python framework to deploy machine learning models fast. So feel free to research on this uh, libraries in Python. They're all free, so feel free to, to use them. Heroku has free uh, tiers, uh, but they also have like pricing models depending on your data needs. You can visit the prototype that I created by scanning the QR code or by accessing the link bashfarm.herokuapp.com for the prototype of the analysis that I did with the Philippine procurement. So in summary, we were able to discuss the procurement dilemma in my country. We also tackled an introduction about network theory and its usefulness in solving real-world problems. We also looked at the use cases and possible methods of quantifying corruption in a procurement data. Now, as a recommendation, we can use these techniques to call out and enhance accountability and transparency in our governments. Using these metrics, we can rally with evidence and objective data to back our claims. We can also use it to encourage citizen science and social responsibilities. It is the responsibility of the citizens to keep in check what the government is doing to make it a democratic process. With these tools, we can empower the people and encourage a culture of data and data literacy, which is very much needed in our context in the Philippines. On the end of the government, we can also use this to improve our systems constructively. For example, if two or more contractors choose to transact for the same firms or agencies, they can benefit from bundling the purchases together. 
and that lowers the price. And the data can also give us insights on potential customers in the public sector by identifying the gaps in the process. What needs to be improved can also be seen in the network graph. And yeah, that's all for my presentation. Uh, thank you so much for this platform to share my advocacies. If you want to connect or collaborate, here are my social media accounts to search Albert or Bashumal. Again, the code that I use is open source and is available in my GitHub. I will also be speaking at PyCon APAC 2021 in Bangkok, Thailand this November on how I use Python for social activism, which includes AI systems for health, education, and economic inclusivity. Hope to see you there as well. And together, let's make the world a better place with technology. Thank you. Thank you, Bush, for your amazing talk. I'm sure we all have learned a lot today. And I have a question for you. What's the most exciting part when you're developing this project? Right. The most exciting part is that it's really alive. So when, when I wake up in the morning, it's all over the news that people are talking about corruption. And when I put online the graphs that I pick, people can relate. And that's really amazing. If the things that you do touch people's lives to make them understand the world better, that's really exciting. So I usually like wake up and get frustrated when I'm doing my day job. But when I'm doing this like Batman projects, I don't feel that it's a job. It's a hobby that, that can be shared to other people so they can use these kinds of technology for uh, their own advocacies too. That's pretty amazing. I love how you bring everyone together into one piece and then share a love along with the world wild. And if there's any, no further questions, this session will come to an end. But if you'd like to ask any follow-up questions, you just want to hang out with Bash, um, feel free to go to R1 Mingo Laundrum and gather. And, and um, well, thank you again, Bash, for your wonderful speech and thank everyone for participating.